Um, I've given oh, about 130 presentations over about 30 years, and I still get nervous, but um, this should go fine. You see just the slide without the black background now, okay? Yeah. Okay, thank yes, you, Kevin. Excellent. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Ben Clemens, Statewide Lamprey Coordinator of Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm really excited to give you a presentation today of an overview of the biology and threats to lampreys. Slides not advancing. Let's try something here. OK, there we go. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything pertaining to lampreys. I'm lamprey 24 seven. And uh, one of the things I hope you get out of this talk uh, is that where to find me for more information. With that in mind, there's going to be a lot of information I'm giving to you in the next 30 to 40 minutes, almost 80 slides, but before you panic, I assure you that most of them are pictures and this will try to make this as painless as possible. I also want to have a disclaimer about uh, that I will provide any kind of formulae for how to, um, you know, uh, exact precise things to do for re restoration that would help lamprey. Uh, rather, um, it's more of a broader aspect of what to do and things to keep in mind. Uh, and lastly, the other thing that's challenging is to condense the great amount of work um, that has been accumulated into a presentation that's accessible. So this will not be a Chilton guide to all the parts on how to put things together. It's going to be more of a gestalt of what Lamprey do and trying to get you to think basin wide. Uh, restoration and passage and my colleagues will provide more uh, fine details for what to do. Uh, before I go any further, one of the comments we've received on these presentations in the past is that this stuff is kind of ho hum. Um, people have already known this stuff and uh, and so I've kind of went intentionally a little bit overboard to show to put in even more information in to show you that there's even more than what I'm presenting. But we have few levers as conservation scientists. One of them is outreach and education and training. Another is habitat restoration, knowing what to do. A third is knowing what to do in terms of passage. And so these are the three main levers, right? But I, I have five take home messages. One is that there's many recent developments, even over the last five years. The second is that Pacific lamprey have uh, a life history that it can be classified as periodic strategy. They live long, they're highly fecund, they die after spawning, and within the life history continuums of fishes, this strategy is right in line with evolving with habitats that have large spatial and temporal variation, that is untamed rivers. Um, in that line of thinking, abundant, cold, clean water with complex habitat basin wide. Uh, I will then briefly cover threats and conservation plans, and then before capitalizing on the other fifth take home is that process based functionality and complexity of habitat is the way to go for lamprey. So without further ado, uh, here's a timeline of cumulative uh, happenings within the lamprey world here in the Pacific Northwest. Number of publications management actions and Oregon chapter of the American Fishery Society presentations. You'll note that they've really ramped up since about 2007. And uh, you know, it's interesting here that the tribes in the Columbia sounded the alarm for Pacific lamprey in the 1990s. The Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative began in 2007 and look how things have really taken off. One of the uh, main points that we like to uh, really hit home with with people is a, a tribal perspective. So from this one from Dave Close of the Umatilla tribe, that the recovery of Pacific lamprey may be linked to salmon recovery. So thinking kind of in terms of ecosystem based management, not fish by fish, so to speak. And um, lamprey are not only used and important by the tribes who harvest them for food and such, but they also provide a number of ecosystem services. They are literally the earthworms of river substrates, tilling and turning over and aerating that those river bottoms 
that allow for sufficient oxygen exchange between the water column and the substrate. Furthermore, they uh, they provide other services too, like uh, providing food for these coho salmon that are uh, feeding on the the stuff that the uh, these spawning lamprey are kicking up, including eggs. Dace have also been um, observed feeding on lamprey eggs. There's also been research elsewhere in North America and other lamprey that these sort of microhabitats that lamprey create during spawning are conducive to benthic macroinvertebrates that juvenile salmon feed on. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that all the different predators that feed on, the more we look, the more we see many different species of birds, reptiles, crustaceans, fishes, on lamprey whenever they can. Probably not surprising because lampreys do not have bones and they are, have a really high caloric content. Um, for example, as adults, their caloric content is three to six times higher than salmon and steelhead. So basically a swimming bacon cheeseburger. Okay, the, the meat of this talk will be on lamprey biology, threats and limiting factors, and then actions. So I'm gonna start with lamprey biology. Um, within Oregon, people often are surprised to learn that there are at least 10 different species of lampreys, most of these occurring in the Klamath Basin, um, other ones being a little bit more cosmopolitan. Among these, Pacific lamprey is the largest and the most cosmopolitan, provided it has access um, to freshwater habitats via the ocean, that is without barriers. So these guys are about three feet long. And from here on out, I'm going to focus on Pacific lamprey for simplicity. And here is a great diagram that was created by Monica Blanchard. She wears many hats and one of them is artist. This is really the, the best diagram I've ever seen. So kudos to her. Uh, Pacific lamprey have a complex life cycle um, and, and she's done a really good job of showing that complexity. Um, one of the things that this diagram arose out of a work group and we had many back and forths and we had to ha she had to go a certain way and 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 so and doing that is it's um it's impossible to describe the complexity even within this so for example adults evidence suggests that they can spawn anywhere from as soon as the first year they enter fresh water to greater than two years but the average is about one year of holding in fresh water before spawning in spring. Um, I, I heard the the uh, the um, salvage of lamprey at Steggerwald at 45,000. That is incredible. That is really awesome. But to put that in perspective, the fecundity of one female lamprey is between 110,000 and 220,000. So, um, you know, it's about a quarter, that salvage is about a quarter of the fecundity of one lamprey. And these are, one millimeter eggs, really tiny. Um, they'll incubate depending on the temperature for about two weeks to a month before they turn into pro larvae, drift downstream. And these are like eyelash sized. Fallout in depositional pool type habitats where it's silty, sandy, soft bombs with organics, but not anoxic. They have to have some oxygen. And they will burrow in and filter feed. And this can be anywhere from three to 10 years with the the Actually, it's more recently found that it's like two years. So, and that is in Southern California, whereas the 10 years is more in colder streams in Idaho. So really temperature dependent. And, and then they will get bigger and then they get the right combination of uh, sunlight stimulants, other environmental stimulants, growth rate, and they will transform from eyeless, toothless, uh, filter feeding animals into eye tooth and uh, juveniles ready to parasitize nekton in the ocean from one to seven years. And so here's a picture of an eye, what we call an eyelash, less than one inch up to six inches. Keep this in mind because when you're doing fish salvage, you know, these uh, these real eyelash sized ones are almost impossible to see when you're hurrying and you need really fine mesh nets in order to net them out. But they can also get quite large, up to six inches. And again, here's a here's the a picture of them in the sediment on the left, and then an actual picture of typical larval lamprey habitat. And uh, amicete, uh, I don't use that word because I consider it jargon, but it is Greek for sand dwellers. 
Some of the work that we did when I was at Oregon State University was doing backpack electrofishing surveys of larval lamprey in the Willamette Basin. Uh, although we often emphasize that they're found in pools, um, you, they should be noted that they can also be found in riffles, but they're more prevalent in pools. But other thing that gets missed is that in off-channel habitats, isolated pools, they were the most abundant. And what do you get? Those off-channel pools is in really complex, sinuous uh, river systems. So here's a transformation to a juvenile showing the teeth and the eyes. And I'm going to completely pass over the marine biology of these species in the interest of time. And we're going to focus on their entry into freshwater coming back upstream. Uh, a lot of focus on conservation has been in restoration has been Oregon Coast coho salmon, uh, comparatively less for Columbia River chum and even less for Pacific lamprey. But I'd like to show this uh, cartoon because it shows that most of the restoration occurs in the small streams where coho salmon occupy and that are easy to restore because you have fewer landowners, fewer liabilities, and it's more tractable. And you have, uh, conversely, much less restoration in large rivers and estuaries for all the other reasons, because of the liability, because it's so huge, because it's hard to do, because there's a number of landowners. Um, and Pacific lamprey and chum are, are occupying those estuaries in large to medium rivers more so than Oregon coast coho salmon. And this is where there can be a lot of benefit for habitat restoration. When we talk about Pacific lamprey, a lot of people don't realize that there is within species diversity. Um, we found that and published on that 10 years ago. People still don't believe me, but since then, um, we have genetic uh, evidence that uh, verifies this. So um, when I was doing my doctorate, we found using phenotype, there's morphology, physiology, numerous uh, indices on the very same fish, evidence for a stream maturing type and an ocean maturing type, or that is uh, um, winter steelhead and a summer steelhead would be the analog here. Um, again, this was verified genotypically that you've got these two different types. And we were initially able to tell by looking at gonad histolo histology in addition to body size, dorsal fin gaps, and many other characteristics. Now, um, what Keith Parker and John Hess and others found is that there's more genetic variation within the stream maturing type and less within the ocean maturing type. That is, the ocean maturing type can only produce ocean maturing, whereas stream maturing can produce both types. So this ocean maturing type we predict would spawn within the same year that they enter freshwater and probably would not penetrate as high up into watersheds. Conversely, stream maturing type or what we've has been known as the classic life history for Pacific lamprey would spawn within about a year after entering freshwater and are expected to penetrate much further upstream in freshwater habitats. We looked at this evidence and other evidence and synthesized it and, and came up with the, uh, the hypothesis that simplified warm water rivers may select for the ocean maturing ecotype. Um, I don't have time to get into all the reasons for that. That is literally a, a second talk. But going back to the genetics with John Hess, he's found that this um, maturity gene with the warm being ocean maturing tend to be more coastal focused, whereas the cool goes further inland. Uh, it is interesting that what the, um, the fish that we initially observed this on and were since verified were in the Klamath River mouth for the ocean maturing. And uh, as people will recognize, the Klamath has a lot of water quality issues and a huge number of impediments to upstream passage, which will change here in the next couple of years as those dams are removed. Um, there's John Hess and others also found another uh, allele for uh, body size, and they, that is the larger body sizes are more apt to go further upstream, whereas the genotype for smaller body size tends to be more coastward, which is interesting because a lot of passage indices for the Columbia River were, uh, that are informing other areas of the Pacific Northwest and West Coast are based on the Columbia River, where you have those large genotypes. And I and others, including Joe, have been 
really uh, trying to remind people, well, we have this other ecotype, this of uh, Pacific lamprey that probably doesn't have those passage capabilities because the smaller you are, the less further upstream you migrate. And even within a fish ladder, the less far upstream in that ladder you will migrate. Now, I want to transition briefly to some of the telemetry studies I did when I was at Oregon State University with Kramer Fish Sciences, uh, funded by C Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and uh, in collaboration with uh, the Grand Ronde Tribe, where we tagged hundreds of adult lamprey at Willamette Falls and then tracked their movements in the main stem Willamette. So first off, let me back up here. At that Willamette Falls is the source of the largest tribal harvest of Pacific lamprey in North America. And the lamprey go in the rocks there where uh, harvesters can get in there and grab them. So again, we track these radio tagged lamprey in the main stem Willamette, and we found, and here's a couple of tracks, A is 2009, B is 2010. And so uh, the, each of these lines is an individual fish. Some really head upstream fast, others go more slowly. Some go upstream and then fall back down. And some went into the Malala and then came back out and then went to the North Stadium and came back out. So really complex behaviors is not necessarily they went from point A to point B, but there's some evidence of searching behavior, including going from an area where some Pacific lamprey occurred, migrating downstream to another area where other Pacific lamprey were found. This is a based on the same study, analyzing the data in a different way and focusing on microhabitat that is water temperature, depth, flow, char um, habitat characteristics. Uh, and what I want to show you here is that uh, in 2010, we had a greater amplitude of flow in the Willamette. And you'll notice that the lamprey went upstream further. So more flow, they go upstream further. Keep in mind what I mentioned earlier with uh, warmer, simplified watersheds. On the other hand, what that might select for the ocean maturing ecotype, where they're not as likely to go upstream and they're going to be subjected to those warmer and warmer temperatures. Now, here's some of the microhabitats we found in that rock revetments, boulders, logs, root wads. It makes sense. You mean sturgeon like to eat these things, great blue heron like to eat these things. And when you're a swimming bacon cheeseburger with no bones, you better find some structure or you were not long for this world. Um, working on another project with uh, CT Clusey and 10 Mile Lakes Basin Partnership and Eel Creek and the Oregon coast. It's a dunal system. It's only about three miles distance between um, the coast and Eel Lake, which is impounded. This is in the mid Oregon coast. Similarly, we find lamprey using structure. So we don't have here a lot of logs and boulders like we have in the Willamette, but we have shores, lines, and we have culverts. And guess where the lamprey go? The radio tank lamp are detected under these structures. Again, it makes sense when you've got 41 predators and animals are literally fighting over you. Now, what brings lamprey back to streams? Uh, flow, I've already mentioned, is a, is a drawer. Uh, larval pheromones via bile acids also draw lamprey in. Colloquially, or rather anthrop Genically, the, the, the way to say this is that, hey, the larvae are saying this is a good way, place to rear your young. But I want to emphasize that pheromones are not always needed. Lots of evidence on the West Coast of North America after dam removals or weir modifications within three to four years, we have recolonization, successful spawning, and larvae produced. And I really want to emphasize that because people really seem to want to think that translocations are always necessary. And the Upper Columbian snake, it makes lots of sense. On the Oregon coast, Washington coast, California coast, it probably doesn't. Um, hitting back more on that flow again, um, we looked at Lieberg Dam and the Mackenzie River and over a time series and found that more flow in a regulated river correlates with more an earlier lamprey passage, but peak passage occurs at annual low flows. So they water the flows, draw them in, they hold, they wait for the right conditions when the flow goes down, temperature warms up a little bit, and they go further upstream. 
Here's an example. Now I should mention Mackenzie's a cold water river, so all this is less than 15 degrees. In the main stem Columbia, it's very different. When you have warmer years with high, uh, less flow, they tend to migrate upstream more quickly. But notice that the most of these fish are passing during those low flows. We've got the statistics to back this up. Now, when they finally get to their location where they want to spawn, which tends to be in pool tailouts and, and gravel and cobble, and by the way, lamprey means uh, liquor of rocks, uh, and that's what they do. They grab onto the rocks and they spawn, and they and so they they'll do this, and they can spawn multiple times. They can be multiple individuals that spawn, and they die after spawning. And those carcasses uh, are provide those marine derived nutrients to ecosystems, including caddisflies, periphyton, crustaceans, you name it. Now, I want to go back. You recall in one of the first slides I showed that the life history strategy for Pacific lamprey is periodic strategists that use seasonal environments. Again, they're long lived, so 13 to 15 years approximately. Many small young, you know, 100 to over 200,000. High variation in recruitment and large seasonal spatial habitat variation, which is what? Unregulated rivers with high sinuosity. Now look at this channelization of the Willamette after uh, European settlers influence with, uh, uh, you know, armoring those banks and then by the mid 1900s impoundment. So the upper Willamette gets successfully more and more channelized. To the point where at Willamette Falls, you originally had masses of lamprey like this that were literally described as looking like kelp to now basically barren rocks. And our proxy for abundance here is harvest. So more lamprey here than occurred at Bonneville Dam historically. And this is only after records were being starting to be uh, recorded and, and kept and then hugely reduced. Usually reduced. And that's not only to um, armoring and impoundment, but all these different threats where the gray shows when the threat started and the dark gray shows when it intensified. And this is the Oregon, the populations of Oregonians. So as human population goes up, land use intensifies, you have all these different threats intensifying, and you have this huge reduction in lamprey numbers. Um, looking at the Willamette here, I know we're focused on the Columbia Estuary, but this is one area I've studied a lot, and it's a, it has a lot of good lessons. A third of this basin is blocked off from access to lamprey, and this is some of the most forested regions because of impoundments. We only have trap and haul at a couple of locations, and Clackamas Basin, by the way, is one of the highest statuses for Pacific lamprey along the west coast of North America. And I think that's because of many factors, including they have the fish have access to the upper basin via trap and haul and, and good passage at River Mill Dam and so forth, but also the high quality of water and habitat in that basin. A very different in the Middle Fork Willamette. And I've likened this to the Willamette. It looks like a heart and all the uh, barriers are like atherosclerosis blocking the passage of blood or in this case lamprey. Uh, we just published this paper that makes this case that saying in the past people say, hey, passage is more important than restoration. We agree with others who have made the case for anadromous fishes in general that passage and restoration need to be um, both considered high priorities uh, basin wide. And here's a colleague from the UK and they said action to protect and enhance Important stocks must be implemented from at least a catchment perspective because many of the issues affecting such species like lamprey are not localized. Well, that we've came to the same conclusion here in the West Coast. So um, looking at threats, and I like to put this in terms of a story narrative, we have a supreme ordeal after white European settlers uh, started really populating the West Coast and um, actually doing practices to remove lamprey before it was known better because it was thought that they competed with salmon and steelhead as laughable as it is to us today. 
and because they created unseemly wounds on these uh, in other fishes, they were there was actually a program to remove them um, by the predecessor of my agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, thankfully, um, that stuff has been mothballed. Um, but more recently, many more actions in the positive way have been undercurring. Um, it went through Christina Wang's and many other people's uh, input with the Lamprey Technical Work Group and then the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative and other conservation plans and more awareness. People are starting to come together to do things to benefit lamprey. And there is some evidence that there are slight increases in the abundance, and I will get to that. And this brings us back to a call to adventure. Do we keep that positive tra trajectory or do we fall back and uh, succumb to land use practices with increasing human population that will be uh, have negative influences to lamprey? So I, I mentioned threats for the Willamette Basin, but widespread threats in general are barriers, uh, water regulation, culverts, particularly ones that um, are perched and are not stream bed simulation design, rapid dewatering, which can kill thousands to millions of lamprey across thousands to millions of uh, barriers and other structures across the West Coast. Um, simplification of streams, low water quality, including really high water temperatures and other pollutants and toxic and legacy toxicants like flame retardants, PCBs and DDT and DDT derivatives and non-native fish like smallmouth bass, which have been shown observationally and empirically to really consume high numbers of larval lamprey that look like worms, which is what I fished for them when I was a kid in Michigan. Which brings us to how do we undo this this negative legacy? So the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission started the um, have, has led the way with their tribal Pacific lamprey restoration plan that came out in 2011. Then the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative came out in 2012 and Christina Wang will talk more about that here in, in a bit. And then um, my agency focused on the conservation plan for four species of lampreys in Oregon. And these are all complementary and are focused in different uh, geographical regions. So just briefly focusing on Oregon on that conservation plan for lampreys, we found that Pacific lamprey and the other, these other species are have a more, have a sensitive status. And I mentioned there's 10 species in, in Oregon. Most of them have um, a status attributed to them a couple aren't even described as science yet, so we have a lot of work to do. That brings us to uh, actions, and this will round up my talk. So education and outreach. Um, there's been a lot of focus in the past to how unseemly these are, and a lot of this has come out from the Great Lakes. Some of us, including Christina and I and others, are, have formed a committee with our friends and colleagues in the Great Lakes who are focused on controlling the invasive sea lamprey and have a huge outreach campaign, so much so that people that migrate from Michigan and come out here bring that information with them and say, "What are you? Why are you trying to conserve lamprey out here?" So we're working with our colleagues in the Great Lakes to try to come up with a, a message that benefits them for controlling sea lamprey in the Great Lakes and conserving our Pacific lamprey out here, including this poster that was created by the Oregon Zoo for their uh, Pacific lamprey exhibit. So Christina and I, um, being tired of, of this negative outreach, wrote this paper and had the title page uh, devoted to this. Um, we actually spoke up where there was a Sea Lamprey International Symposium and the Sea Lamprey folks were lamenting that their outreach was not working. And so I said, your outreach is working too well. And so we wrote this this paper and it, it uh, made some people mad, but uh, we're now working with them. Here's some example of more outreach for lampreys in Oregon. We have this brochure. If you Google lamprey Oregon, we have a lamprey web page. You can download this. I also have hundreds of these brochures. I'd be happy to give out. We have an Oregon field guide episode devoted to the Miller Lake lamprey which is the world's smallest parasitic lamprey. Um, that is a whole talk its own. And we have a Beaver State podcast focused on lamprey. 
So um, working with um, people, others, including uh, those on this call, that we put together a Lamprey ID workshop, a Portland State University Lamprey short course, a 2020 River Restoration short course, uh, and then a community science outreach in the Willamette, and more recently a Lamprey biology and identification workshop. Looking at that community science, this is with uh, high school and middle school students. Uh, they came up with these uh, these word grams here, or we came up with them based on their inter interviewing them. And so previously they had a very negative uh, outlook on lamprey. Following our course and getting out in the field and holding lamprey, they got very excited. And this was their descriptions of, of their um, experience. And this was an impromptu photo. They were so excited. They said, get in here. Yeah, we're going to get a picture. I was a little nervous with the masking, but we made it happen. And then working with the Confederate tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sislaw, our district staff for ODFW and the 10 Mile Lakes Basin Partnership, we created these signs that accompany the lamprey passage structure down there that tells why lamprey are important, why they need passage, and the tribal uh, perspective. Then working with Monica, and others, we also um, created this flyer. A lot of the credit goes to Ralph Lantman and Monica for this flyer. There's evidence that lamprey are being used as bait in the Columbia Basin, which is illegal. So we've put out this brochure, or sorry, this flyer, and people can look at the QR codes and scan those, and it goes to our angling regulations. So we're pretty excited about that. Looking at passage, uh, we have uh, about a half a dozen different lamprey passage structures around the state, and these are aluminum flumes. Uh, NOAA Fisheries and the Corps of Engineers has a really substantial set of flumes at Bonneville Dam, and the lamprey will um, adhere to these by their mouths, and they, our lamprey are unique, the Pacific lamprey, because they can climb wetted surfaces if they're constructed in the right way. We've also analyzed uh, passage efficiency to uh, ground truth the historical lamprey uh, video counts at the in the ladders of Leeberg Dam and the McKenzie using a telemetry study, which is uh, the, uh, we have a manuscript that's in review right now on that. And then the lamprey technical work group has put together a best management guidelines for native lampreys during in water work. And this is some of the best, one of the best white papers in my opinion out there for salvaging and the reasons for for and how to do that. Also, uh, I think Christina alluded to this, the, the Lamprey Technical Work Group has came up with a white paper. I've shared this with Catherine Corbett on comparison of salmon life histories and Pacific lamprey life histories. Looking at habitat restoration, that is the million dollar question. We have, um, our agencies have worked together to look at uh, lamprey, larval lamprey occurrence uh, at a couple of stage zero habitat restoration sites and control sites. And so while we're not quite in an area where we can give more specifics on what to do for lamprey, I've alluded to some of them during this talk. In about five years or so, we hope to have many more details. Dewatering, uh, I mentioned how bad that is. Um, a lot of credit goes to Joe Skaliski and uh, Julie Harris from Fish and Wildlife Service for helping design this study at Lieberg. And uh, we've published this information for the effects of dewatering. About half of the lamprey during dewatering will stay subsurface. Monitoring in abundance. A lot of people used to think that we couldn't do that without dam counts. And then they said, well, you can't do it because they make test reds. Um, well, we that wasn't good enough for us. So we put our heads together and came up with abundance estimates using red surveys. With the understanding that, yeah, they do make test reds, but there is published information on lamprey per red, which is less than one. And um, we've looked at three different sources and they all had very similar numbers. And so we took our abundance in index, or we estimated the abundance index based on the average peak in reds, the di distance of spawning survey and lamprey per red. It came up with these estimates. And what it shows is that, well, the it's classical for everybody to say lamprey have declined and are declining. Technically, that's no longer exactly accurate. They oscillate based on ocean conditions. They go up and down. 
and they've increased modestly. They're just a small proportion of what they used to be 100 to 200 years ago, but they're going up and down and increasing, which, uh, which is like what the Buddha would say, that the only constant is change. So when you hear that they're declining, just remember that it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, we are also interested in monitoring distribution, including by electrofishing surveys. This is Clatskany Creek. That's Monica there and myself and others. But we also are doing surveys whenever we can, and we mentioned including eDNA. Um, we commonly get uh, approached with what's a good way to do lamprey surveys, and there's probably, um, I don't know, maybe 20 or more different ways to do backpack electrofishing alone. And so we looked at the literature around the world and came up with this synthesis. And, and the one of the, the take homes was that there is no magic bullet. It depends on your logistics, your questions and your finances. Uh, we have a, another paper in, in a review right now led by my colleague here at ODFW, Kara Onloff Dunn, looking at species distribution models of Pacific lamprey on the West Coast in relation to barriers. And uh, water quality, uh, there's different aspects of this. One of the things I'm most interested in is warm water temperatures. We had a, a die off at Willamette Falls in 2008. Temperatures were 22 degrees plus uh, for extended periods of time. And then we had another one here in South Umpqua where they were 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, a lot of people in the interior of Columbia still don't believe this um, or kind of brush this off, but there's some of this is, this paper also provides evidence from other studies, <clears throat> pardon me, in the Umatilla that indicates that it's affecting their upstream migration. If you don't have the flow, if you don't have cool water temperatures, they don't want to migrate upstream, which goes back to what I mentioned earlier, that selecting for an ocean ecotype or no lamprey to penetrate that far upstream. This is a lot of information. I can provide this via uh, publication. Just know that um, in my mind, when you get 20 degrees Celsius and above for extended periods of time, it's not good for lamprey. So here's our um, here's our story, and it's up to us if we want to have the, the heroes return and the call to adventure to maintain that, or if we're going to slip back into another supreme ordeal. Uh, I thank you for your patience. I'm almost done here. Um, predictions over the next 50 years, passage and water quality will become increasingly important. Uh, we'll likely to lose lampreys in some highly altered and blocked rivers. Resident lampreys will lose habitat, and this will lead to difficult management decisions. And animus lampreys and their hosts are moving poleward. There is evidence for that. Some populations benefit, whereas others decrease. And we'll get more acknowledgement of their importance, more acknowledgement that it's an indication of healthy rivers or interest among Oregonians for the non-game native species, which I really like. I'm, I'm all for the underdogs like Pacific lamprey. And there will be more and more opportunities for collaboration. I just hope that we don't have two different trajectories, the fish going down, whereas our understanding goes up. We need both to go up. There will be more of focus on the other lampreys, that is not Pacific lamprey, but the data will still be lacking and uh, it'll be really hard to come out of that, be, that inertia because of lack of funding. There'll be a push for more monitoring and restoration. And last but not least, really wanna hit home on this because I always get uncomfortable when I'm asked, what should we do for lamprey habitat wise? I've provided examples and suggestions during this talk for different things that can be done, different considerations but I really would urge folks to, to get rid of the Chilton's car guide approach to habitat restoration and go more towards a gestalt of process-based functionality and complexity. And this body of knowledge has came to me over the course of a couple of decades, and it would not have been possible without funding and collaboration by dozens of individuals from many different organizations. And these again are the take home messages. And I would be happy to take any questions, but I imagine you probably want to do that at the end. Do you want to do um, one question really quick and then we can hold the rest of the questions towards the end after all the other speakers? Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Haida has her hand up. 
<laughs> hey, Ben, that was, oops, let me put my video on. That was awesome, and I learned a ton. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to that slide toward the beginning where you showed the different sizes of streams and then estuaries and the kind of relative importance of restoration, I think is what you were getting at with that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then maybe just hit home exactly what you were saying about the estuarine component of that. Not exactly sure if I got the takeaway right. Yeah, that one, that 22. Yeah, and I don't think I did a good job on the highest. So thank you for your question. Um, you know, we are lacking data on Pacific lamprey and large rivers and estuaries, but what we've seen is that they do occupy main stem rivers. There is some evidence of spawning in main stem rivers. And, and uh, this, I think it's overlooked because these smaller streams are easier um, to do restoration on. And that's where the focus has been for like, say, coho salmon. Um, you have fewer landowners here, fewer liabilities, fewer, less real estate. And it's just easier, right, um, than than to do down here. Um, not does that answer your question? So, this, um, this what's what's the take home for large river estuaries? I guess would be my question. More more restoration focused, um, and that's and so, I guess I probably didn't describe here too. These colored bars are showing the relative habitat use by these individuals. So you've got uh, species like chum and lamprey are using these large rivers and estuaries quite a bit. And so they just need more focus. I feel like there's been a lot of focus on small streams, much less focused restoration wise on the larger rivers. OK, I, I'm just wondering because we found lamprey in the in um, Sitka spruce swamps on the Columbia estuary in the pools between log jams in the Sitka spruce swamps. And so I'm wondering if I'll send you guys some information and stuff um, that puts together what I'm thinking about. But um, I'm just kind of wondering in general if there's a case to be made for them holding when they come in. You said they come in at high flows and hold. Yeah. Is it possible? I'm wondering if it's possible that they're holding in the spruce swamps. Because they're colder, we have we have um, data showing they're colder, at about two degrees colder as well. So, so I'll send you are, some info. Haida, are these adults or larvae? Um, you know, it's been like fifteen years since we did that electrofishing. I'm going to have to go back and look at what I, I didn't okay. do it myself. Um, okay. I contracted it, so I'm going to have to go back and look. Okay, because based on the answer to that, I have further questions, and then. Yeah, I'd be interested in talking with you more with you if you get when if and when you have a chance to look at that. Okay, absolutely. I'm excited about it. Thanks. Good, good. And you're welcome. I'll just add a little bit to that. We do have um for estuary environments a white paper barriers to tidal connectivity um, that could speak to some of this information, but it is one of those areas that's tough to study um lampreys in a, in a saline environment because our primary tool, electrofishing, um, doesn't work. Okay, hey, awesome. Thank you. Um, so the next one, uh, the next presentation is going to be Christina, and she's going to talk about lamprey conservation status and efforts. So we actually decided that it would be most effective if I go last. So ah, is it okay. is it okay if we switch it up a little bit? Have at it. Yeah. Okay. Who do you okay. want? Who's next? <laughs> you call. I think so it was me. Joe. Okay, yeah, Joe. Joe. Joe is going to go next. OK, awesome, right. thank you. And I'm generally the most technologically challenged of the group, so bear with me. <laughs> All right, are, are you seeing uh, my title slide in full? Yes. OK, good. Perfect. And I, I just want to touch on what Ben said about, you know, restoration practic practitioners looking for this magical guide. Um, I think an analogy that's fitting is if you're going to, if you're a gardener and you're going to plant a crop, you really have to know about the biology of what you're planting and all the different crops. How wide do the rows need to be? How deep do the seeds need to be? What's the soil pH? Do I need a trellis? So what Ben really provided you is a, a foundation to build your garden, AKA uh, your restoration project. So with that, um, I'm gonna talk about integrating lamprey passage into restoration. Is it advancing for you? Yes. Okay. Perfect. 
So um, this easily could be an hour talk. This is going to be maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, objectives are to raise awareness of how lamprey biology is different than salmonid biology, review the behavior, and address the most common types of barrier. Again, our uh, awesome life cycle guide that Monica put together, I'm going to focus on the adult portion. And what I really want to highlight is um, that lamprey could be, depending where they are from the basin, um, as Ben said, from high snake water drainages, you know, up to 10 years in those environments. But upon report returning, they could be 18 years old. That's way older than a salmonid could be. And it'd be a shame if, because of work that we've done, we've basically precluded that um, very end of their life cycle. So swimming, the, um, I guess one way to think about it is they swim more like uh, a snake than probably most fish that you know. Um, it's this angular form swimming mode. It's, it's less efficient. Um, they cannot swim nearly as fast and it's not incorporated into fishway design. I'm not going to talk about that in detail today or at all, really, but we have some information on how this could be done um, in really fast uh, velocity environments. So swimming abilities, um, I think the takeaway here is if you look at the scale, this is in feet per second, um, you know, maybe approaching four feet per second. And this work was done specifically for the larger bodied Columbia River uh, lampreys, adult lampreys. We don't know how the smaller bodied coastal adult lampreys compare, and we really have no idea what it means for their smaller cousins in the Lampetra genus. Many fishway entrances alone um, can be up to 10 feet per second. Not a big deal for any adult salmonids that can swim upwards of 16 to 18 feet per second. They do have this unique burst and attach um, movement pattern, whereas if the, the surface is smooth, they can, they can attach, coil up their body and burst forward for some amount of time. But a lot of our old fishways, rocks, various surfaces um, aren't like that. And the aging infrastructure of a lot of our fishways, fish ladders and barrier dams are really not very good for that. So with that, let's uh, let's take a look at that behavior of climbing. And this only two lampreys in the world can do this. The other is the pouch lamprey. So that gives you an idea of, of what can happen. And when you see um, lar or adults stacked up like that, it's usually an indication of a significant passage barrier. They're queued up, they're winning their turn to pass. And if you're wondering where that was, that was at um, Staggerwald at the fish ladder before we uh, did the restoration, but now they can get up there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. That was in California. So some recent news fresh off the press, um, ODF and W has recently updated their fish passage guidelines and some highlights for that are fish passage means the ability by the weakest native migratory fish and life stages determined by the department to require passage at the site to move either volitionally or by trap. And this doesn't mean that everywhere that fish passages up because they're doing restoration or they're doing a modification that this will occur. But native migratory fish includes Western River lamprey, Pacific Brook lamprey, and Western Brook lamprey. This potentially could be a game changer. And if we start building fishways that, you know, we're doing it now um, for Pacific lamprey, which does facilitate a lot of other smaller bodied native fishes to pass. But if we if we can do it for, say, 
you know, western brook lamprey, this could very well provide passage for almost all uh, endemic species. So critical swimming performance for lampreys. Um, again, just to reiterate, you know, for our largest lampreys, it's close to three feet per second. Burst and attach, it's a little faster, but we don't have the data for these smaller bodied lampreys to really put into the garden. How deep does our, our row need to be? So what velocities do we need to provide in these fishways? So that's an area of need. So a little bit more about behavior. Um, adult lampreys are primarily nocturnal. Well, you might just say, well, I saw a video of them in the daylight. That's most commonly when there's a big barrier and they're all bottled up. They're susceptible to predation. They don't want to be around at night. Even for spawning ground surveys, you'll typically see reds, um, but not always adults because they'll go for cover during the daytime. Typical passage, if you do want to look at behavior, and it is one of the best ways to observe whether or not a facility is marginally passable or a significant barrier, is to go out and observe their barrier. But peak passage, at least at Bonneville Dam, uh, generally is between 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So you've got to be on the graveyard shift. Uh, they are demersal. They travel near the bed, and this is typically where velocities are lower. Um, if they're up near the surface, it's because they're probably using burst and attach to move along that wetted wall and find a route of passage. And they're negatively phototaxic, so you don't want to build a fish ladder and have maybe you have a counting window with all these big bright lights that could affect their ability to pass. There is a growing body of information uh, on lamprey passage. Just last year, we updated our guidelines, practical guidelines for incorporating adult Pacific lamprey passage at fishways. These are all living documents, and as we get more science and data to update them, we do just that. Uh, the middle one is for building these uh, aluminum ramps, um, LPSs. Ben showed one uh, at Bonne or that was at uh, Winchester. Um, they're very common. They're just one approach. They're not a silver bullet, so it depends on a number of factors before you put one of these in. They can be time consuming. They take power. Um, they can have issues just like anything else. And just a couple of years ago, barriers to adult Pacific lamprey at road crossings. Um, and all these, again, are available at PacificLamprey.org. So fishway considerations. Um, if you're going to build a new one, that's the ideal place to start. But there are many types of ladders, vertical slots, typical uh, weir, weir type ladders, overflow weirs, and they all have different hydraulics. Um, they can have false attraction flows or they can have in, inadequate attraction flows. Typically, you want it to be about 10% of the total flow so they can find the route of passage. But oftentimes there's there's limited or no continuous attachment surfaces, and this is often the greatest case at the entrance to a fishway where velocities are the fastest. There's auxiliary water supply systems that are typically plumbing a bunch of extra water right at the fishway entrance, and this is typically the fastest part of the fishway. Pickets are typically used um, for fish ladders um, in conjunction with uh, auxiliary water supply systems, or also for adult counting systems or trapping. Um, so if it's greater than an inch, that'll usually allow lamprey to go through, um, but that would uh, provide the option to uh, trap adult salmonids. And if you want to preclude them, um, at least for Columbia River, the larger body fish needs to be less than seven tenths of an inch. Counting stations, think about your lighting, um, transition areas, confusing flow patterns. There's a very confusing flow pattern at Bonneville Dam. And sadly, only 50% of all uh, passing lampreys at Bonneville Dam are successful. And one of them is this area called the serpentine section, where it really changes directions like almost 360 degrees within each weir. And that's known to be the very worst spot for lamprey passage at Bonneville Dam. Large dams, large structures, resting areas are good. And it provides them time to recuperate, and it also provides cover from predators. 
Um, I've mentioned the PLCI, the Lamprey Technical Working Group. Um, two specific groups would really apply well to this group, the Adult Passage Engineering Group and the Restoration Group. Uh, and Monica, we'll be talking about restoration in a bit. So integrating lampreys into fishway design. Um, the key is to plan early. Um, usually around 30% design is when you have enough information to make informed decisions um, how to change the fishway. We did that for the fishway here that's depicted. We had the 30% designs. We incorporated a bunch of elements and this is you know, to ODF and W's credit. Um, that all happened and the engineer got an award from the governor for these designs. Um, really pretty remarkable. Uh, one special way um, just to it's it's specific to salmonids, but it can be more specific to lampreys is orifices. These orifices should be located close to the bottom in the corners where they can burst and attach through because the velocity still could be fast through the orifices, but if they can hold on, they can slip through. 90 degree angles. If you think about if you're bursting and attaching and you're holding on to something, if you're going around a corner and you've got to let go and you get blasted in the face with all this water, the outcome's not going to be good. And overall high velocities are just something to look out for. And we're here to help. The Lamprey Technical Work Group um, is more than happy to, to be involved. So here's a couple of examples of the aging infrastructure. You can see what, the, what happens to the concrete and these picket spacings. In, in this case, this is part of a juvenile hatchery salmon return where the juvenile salmon could go through, but also uh, adult lamprey were going through there. Retrofits, 90 degree corners are a great way to do a retrofit. You might think about the radius on a typical bucket, approximately six inches. That's ideal for lampreys. Cutting orifices on existing structures is something you can do. Adding ramps, aluminum ramps on a case by case basis only. But you could also add aluminum plates and surfaces. Uh, or you might imagine like through a weir or over the top of a weir crest where they want to slip around the side. Removal of the structure is certainly an option, and that has uh, occurred due to some of our lamprey surveys. And you can also remove it depending on the species of adult someone is returning and put a seasonal weir in the same location to guide salmonids back into the hatchery. Resting boxes uh, can be a good thing, especially in larger facilities, smooth surfaces, and actually doing some annual maintenance where you go out there with a power washer or a brush and smooth the surfaces typically along either end of the fishway or barrier dam. And one that's, I think, often overlooked is cover. Um, a lot of these barrier dams act as uh, at least a temporary barrier, if not a, a significant barrier, and without adequate cover below them in the form of large boulders, rocks with crevices, large wood, they're very susceptible to predation. So here's an example of why rounded corners matter. This is at a fishway entrance, but you could imagine a lot of fishways like a vertical slot might have 10, 15, 20, or 100 of these things that each lamprey has to specifically navigate. So you can see not all of them make it, but a significant portion are able to go around that corner, even though there's some really hot velocities. Here's some example of these structures. They come in all shapes and sizes from, you know, only as high as a couple of feet to several feet. Um, and there are ways to retrofit them. But one thing to point out, um, especially in Oregon and Washington, where we've done a lot of work, some of these don't even have a fish ladder. Um, the point being that they are adult salmonids are counted, enumerated to make sure they're in compliance with their proportion of hatchery origin spawners above and below. Um, but it provides them a tool to enumerate, but at the same time, it could really preclude and limit native fish passage. 
So this is an example of a project we did at one of our own hatcheries, Warm Springs National Fish Hatchery. We did an evaluation of the structure and based on a number of um, a number of elements that we measured, it was unlikely that lamprey were getting through this facility in significant numbers. So we put one of these aluminum ramps to basically navigate the fishway. This is the entrance. This is the barrier dam specifically designed for zero fish passage. So the lamp race could get up and over. This is inside the structure, what it looks like, and this is kind of a slow motion form of their burst and attach movement. It also provides us a monitoring tool to count lampreys. So barriers, um, you could think of barriers as you know many shapes and sizes, but um, some of them could preclude passage. They could cause delay, and they could cause predation. You saw this slide from Ben's presentation, but if delay is significant, it could actually lead to you know, delayed mortality and pre-spawn mortality, which after all that life cycle, maybe up to 18 years, they don't get the chance. And it's just, just a tragedy. But what about grade control structures? We, we see these and they're very commonly used um, in restoration projects. Uh, I've seen them at Staggerwald. I've seen this is uh, a tributary to the Clackamas. And they're probably not a barrier for Pacific lamprey, but for other other smaller bodied lampreys, it very well could be, whereas they likely can only swim a couple of feet per second. And the point is there's there's various ways to control grade. And the take home message here is no lampreys can jump, not even an inch. So if passage barriers are being evaluated, this one, you know, potentially depending on what state you're in, what the rules are, it, it, it might be fine. Um, but for lampreys, depending on the flow, the backwater up to the lip, it could be a complete barrier. And just to touch on, you know, passage is two ways. We need aquatic connectivity upstream to downstream. Um, there are many, many irrigation diversions. Um, there's diversions for every hatchery to run the hatchery, and we see entrained larvae at pretty much every one of these facilities that we've looked at. Um, we know that NOAA compliant screens, um, 2.38 millimeters round, is only going to prevent um, at least entrainment that is going through the screen for larval lampreys that are 75 millimeters or greater. We do have some work, some recent work looking at screen sizes. Um, I can't share that with you now, but basically what I, I can tell you is, in short, um, the small guys, less than 50 millimeters, are much more highly likely to be entrained. And orientation matters, approach and sweeping velocities are critical components. The higher the sweeping velocity past the screen, generally, uh, a proportionate uh, reduction in velocities. So in summary, uh, lamprey are poor um, swimmers compared to salmonids. 90, 90 degree corners alone can preclude passage. There's lots of options to do retrofits and we're here to help. That will do it. Thank you, Joe. Um, is there is there any um, questions for Joe really quick? And then I think we're switching over to Monica. Is that right? Any questions for Joe really quick? Awesome. All right, Monica. I can All see right. your slide. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hello again, everyone. Uh, I am going to be speaking to you all about integrating lampreys into habitat restoration, but much like uh, Joe and Ben have discussed, <laughs> we know very little about restoration and lamprey. We've been spending decades working on 
understanding how our actions have impacted our salmonid species. And we've been also working on decades worth of ameliorating those impacts. And still we're learning a lot when it comes to restoration for salmonids. When it comes to our Pacific lamprey and our other native lamprey species, we are quite a bit behind. We still have a lot of huge data gaps, um, including just basic distribution and abundance information, understanding of limiting factors, and as Ben mentioned, uh, just getting a handle on some of the population structure information for these species. And that's mostly Pacific lamprey. When it comes to other native lamprey species, we have lots of unknowns. So when we're thinking about including our lampreys in restoration, we don't have a cookie to approach to any restoration strategies, but when it comes to Pacific lamprey, we still have, we just don't have a lot of information. So what we're trying to encourage people to do is understand habitat use across their life stages, um, understand your local threats, and then integrate lamprey into all steps of our restoration project. So really thinking about our projects from a lamprey lens and also our streams themselves. So when it comes to integrating lamprey, we want to be thinking about them at that pre-project assessment when you're first going on site and thinking about what restoration projects are, are doable at this site and what you're kind of thinking you want to do. Um, incorporating design elements that are beneficial to our native lampreys. And then when it comes to implementation, thinking about the fact that you might have uh, multiple life histories and multiple species present and what can you do to conserve lampreys when you're actually implementing your projects. So um, as far as habitat goes, um, I just want to hit on the fact that uh, Ben did a great job of describing the different life stages, but across those life stages, um, lamprey are utilizing a ton of different habitats. And so at that larval stage, they're using those fine sediments, nice silty, high organic materials. As they grow a little bit larger, they're moving a coarser material that's unembedded, that they can be in those interstitial spaces. And when they return to freshwater, um, as Ben mentioned, they can stay in our freshwater systems for a couple of months to a couple of years preparing for spawning. And so they're going to need protection during that time from predators and high flows. So large wood, um, boulders, structure in the stream. And then when they're spawning, they need clean gravels and cobbles, much like we see our salmonid spawning in. But again, that unembedded um, coarser material. So we need to provide a wide swath of habitat for these fish to complete their life history. Um, so that is our kind of baseline understanding um, of where lamprey might be in our streams, but we also have um, a, a habitat or a distribution map that I would say, depending on where you are, um, is more or less helpful. Um, here in the lower Columbia, we actually have a decent distribution information. Um, it is likely still truncated compared to where Pacific lamprey are found on the landscape, but it's a good place to start. But I, what I like to encourage folks to think about is that if you're considering anadromous salmonids in your project, you likely should be considering anadromous lampreys as well. Um, we use salmonid distributions as a surrogate when it comes to Pacific lamprey if we don't have uh, distribution information. And so thinking about initially, if you're targeting your restoration, which most of the time we are for our Pacific salmon and steelhead, we probably should be thinking about our native anadromous lampreys as well as our potentially resident lampreys. Um, I also like to just point out that when you are first on your project site, um, think about habitat that is existing on your project site for lamprey. So that fine sediment is not something that we oftentimes cue in on when we're thinking about salmon and steelhead. Um, we oftentimes think of it as a negative thing and in excess, it is also negative for our lampreys. But when we're thinking about our um, habitat and how it's functioning currently, targeting those fine sediment areas, thinking about how they might be supporting that kind of nursery for our larval lamprey. And then if they're spawning of our salmonids, um, we do see a lot of overlap in our spawning substrates. And so thinking about the fact that this site might be providing spawning opportunities for our Pacific lamprey. And so you're going to potentially have multiple species and multiple life stages present at your locations. And thinking about uh, incorporating threats and understanding what those are like on the landscape, Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative, which Christina is going to talk more about um, in our next presentation, has done a assessment of um, basically conservation risk for our native for our Pacific Lamprey. Um, and you can tell by this map that we have a lot of conservation need. Um, but what I mostly want to talk about in this case is the fact that at this watershed scale, as part of this assessment, we have also done a threat analysis. So 
Within the lower Columbia, there we have information at a watershed scale of the threats that are kind of our high priority threats um, when it comes to protecting and conserving Pacific lamprey. So you can utilize this information to understand how we might target and benefit lamprey within the watersheds that you're working in. Um, and these are all available on the PacificLamprey.org website um, under our Regional Management Unit tab. Um, and these are our regional implementation plans that are updated on an annual basis. And this um, threat evaluation and assessment level update is every five years. So we're continually updating this to understand what is impacting our lamprey at this watershed scale. And as Ben mentioned for the Willamette, we have seen a history of loss and simplification, and this extends to all of our streams across the Northwest. As all of you listening are very aware, we have a lot of impacts to our streams, and this has led to oftentimes simplification, um, mi minimizing our flow paths. So we are oftentimes looking at single thread channels. Um, our lateral and hyper conductivity has been uh, decreased in many cases. We have a lot less structure in our streams. Our riparian areas have been greatly changed and our high and low flows are oftentimes greatly altered as well. And as Joe uh, just talked about, our lateral conductivity is oftentimes greatly reduced for Pacific lamprey. So when it, we're thinking about habitat, we really wanna encourage complexity. So restoring those systems that we have greatly simplified. Um, so restoring all these benefits that we see that help our native salmonids, but also help all of our other native fish. And so um, thinking about uh, best management practices for restoration more and more, especially in the Northwest, we're moving towards these process based restoration that are including the restoration of physical, chemical and biological processes. So not just creating the form, we want to create the processes that sustain those forms. Um, and so these can be considered kind of a, a reset to predisturbance conditions and really focus on connecting our river and floodplains. And so many of you are probably familiar with the stage zero restoration strategies and incorporating beaver into restoration. Those are examples of trying to restore those natural river processes, which we think is going to be very beneficial for our native lamprey species. And oftentimes in those um, process-based restoration strategies, but also in other situations, um, removing uh, confining structures is one of the best things that can be done to enhance our landscapes. Um, so really enhancing that lateral connectivity, which can increase our hyperic exchange, which our lampreys are living in that hyperic zone for years and years. So making sure that we have a lot of that annual wetted area. Um, create, this is ideally creating those diverse habitats that lamprey utilize at multiple life stages and that proximity to those habitats so they can move within the ecosystem there that's providing those different um, beneficial uh, habitats within their across their life stage. Another element um, of many uh, many of our restoration strategies is including large wood enhancements. So uh, we did a very thorough job of removing large wood from our stream systems, and now we're actively trying to put it back. And we think that a lot of these actions that we've done in the name of salmon are likely benefiting our lamprey species, um, both at the larval and adult stages. So large wood and structure in the stream creates that great sediment sorting. So it's pockets of deposition and erosion, which lead to fine sediment passages, as well as consolidation of spawning gravels and cobbles. Um, it can increase connectivity to our floodplains and oftentimes is used in conjunction with a number of different restoration strategies, um, diversify that flow path. So again, creating that diverse habitat and increasing cover for our adult lampreys that are gonna be moving back through these systems and holding for months to years. And there is some, um, actual research happening in this department, which is very exciting. John Crandall with the Metau Salmon Recovery Foundation has uh, done an assessment of large wood structures that were initially placed to benefit salmonid species, um, but he's looking at whether or not they are supporting lamprey. And um, just presented on this uh, last week at the Salmon Recovery Conference, um, and he's going to have a more thorough uh, information out in the near future, but um, take-home messages where lamprey were utilizing those fine sediment patches, um, and potentially larger structures are better because they're just creating more habitat and they're having larger um, um, 
find sediment patches associated with those structures. So um, stay tuned for that. Very exciting. Um, and as Ben mentioned, we also have some restoration uh, or monitoring focused on stage zero restoration, um, which uh, again, we have this uh, a lack of actual uh, research into how these restoration strategies are impacting lamprey. And so slowly but surely, we're going to get more and more information about this. But it's exciting because we're actually utilizing lamprey monitoring methods to try to understand how these uh, restoration sites are functioning for lamprey. Um, and to date, we've done kind of some post restoration monitoring on the South Fork Mackenzie and Five Mile Bell Creeks. And then starting this summer, we're going to be working on a pre survey for Quartz Creek and then extending that to post restoration studies. So um, this was exciting research that will be um, happening, uh, currently happening, and will hopefully lead to some good insights. Um, and I think the take home for what we would recommend is, as uh, Ben said in the first talk, lamprey have evolved in very dynamic systems, just like our salmon and steelhead. And what we're learning when we are thinking about restoration in the context of salmon and steelhead, complexity and scale are really important. Um, we need to be thinking about projects that are messy and large and are going to provide that that expansive habitat um, and diverse habitat for our native species. Um, another kind of element of many of our restoration projects involves water quality, and we see a lot of overlapping benefits when it comes to our salmonids and our lampreys. They need cold and clean water. Um, excessive sediment loads can be detrimental to our lamprey species. Um, it can smother their nests as well as our salmon and lamprey reds. So um, even though they utilize that fine sediment, um, oftentimes our systems that have an overload of fine sediment are not necessarily providing a diversity of habitat and are oftentimes highly simplified. So not necessarily um, ideal for the entire life cycle of our lampreys. Um, and again, lamprey are in the freshwater system for a long time. And so any impacts to water quality um, could be see, could be impacting them more because they're their long uh, freshwater residency. So all the work that's being done for riparian plantings, fencing, livestock include exclusion, um, and any stormwater treatment are likely to have good benefits for our native lampreys. So we've thought about the fact that our lampreys are present. We have thought about the habitat that exists on the landscape for a project site. Um, we're thinking about those de design elements, and then we're going to construct our projects. And this is where um, I actually started to get interested in lamprey from the project management side of things, because um, when you get out to your site and all of a sudden you are dewatering and there are lamprey, in your system that you didn't even realize were there, um, you have to make a plan. And so um, thinking about this ahead of time is really beneficial. Um, and our in-water work periods have been designed to protect our salmonids for get very good reasons, obviously, um, but that does not necessarily protect our native lamprey species. So typically our summer in-water work frame timeframes, um, we can have adult lampreys actively spawning or holding. We can have eggs in the gravel. We can have our transforming juveniles, which are our smolt equivalent present and we will likely have multiple cohorts of uh, larval lamprey present at our site. So knowing that ahead of time allows us to think about the extent of our project and our dewatering, and if there's any way to um, avoid high density locations, um, and if not avoid, um, how we would deal with that. Um, so another component of that implementation that is not oftentimes considered ahead of time is that we actually utilize different monitoring um, and salvage techniques when it comes to our lamprey species. So first of all, we utilize uh, different waveforms for our electrofishing settings. So this is a common tool in our toolkit for salvage is going out with our electrofishers and removing our bony fish. Um, but those settings actually can trap our larval lamprey in the sediment. And so we need to incorporate tactics that actually target our lamprey to get them out of the sediment when we're doing our salvages. Um, our minnow traps and some of our other kind of first line um, of removal strategies are not going to be effective for our larval lamprey. And oftentimes we don't have the equipment on site, such as nets that are small enough mesh size to actually capture our lamprey, even if they're coming up. So thinking about this ahead of time and preparing is um, maybe the, the, the big take home from the implementation side of things. 
And so having a lamprey salvage plan um, ahead of time will save a lot of time and hopefully um, be more effective. So in as I mentioned, if we can avoid dewatering reds or areas of really high larval density and muscle beds, um, that is kind of the ideal. That's obviously not always possible, especially in these contexts of these large scale projects. Um, we may not have that option. And so thinking about having the appropriate tools on site, um, fine mesh nets, both small and large, um, an extra bucket and air and leaving that on site is very helpful because larva lamprey like to come up after the fact. Um, and so having that appropriate equipment is very important. Um, we recommend a slower drawdown rate, um, one to two inches per hour, which can be very slow, um, but that increases self uh, rescue rates. And so in preparation for salvage, is it possible to start that slow process ahead of time? Um, and that is again, very project dependent. There is no um, one size fits all when it comes to salvage. Um, depending on the conditions, um, emergence time can vary greatly. So we tend to see a good chunk of uh, larvae coming up within the first 30 or so minutes. However, it can take a lot longer in some cases. Um, and so again, keeping that bucket and net on site so you can keep removing lamprey from the project site is really beneficial. Um, and as Joe mentioned, uh, only about 50% of larvae emerge um, when they are first dewatered. And so we use a dry shocking technique to uh, encourage them out of the sediment. And so this is using that burst pulse setting um, that I showed a couple slides ago. Basically, that's a three pulses per second. So it's not a continuous pulse and it allows um, for the lamprey to move against the electricity. And hopefully this is not too choppy for everyone. Um, but you can see where uh, the shocking has started and you can start to see all these larval lamprey popping up. Um, and so they uh, were, you know, if you were to look at this with your bony fish eyes, you would say, great, we dewatered this site and we're ready to uh, work on construction. But in fact, there's a ton more fish um, at this location. So we recommend just additional dewatering steps. Um, and again, planning ahead. Um, there's many, many folks on this call that have been involved in lamprey salvage uh, at this point and uh, planning ahead, having extra time, extra equipment and extra people is oftentimes extremely um, essential. And so um, thinking about that is uh, one of the most beneficial things that we can do ahead of time. But when we're actually out on the site, if it's possible to do a pre a drawdown presence absence survey, that can be helpful to know where you have high densities and where you need to target your efforts. That's not a Always possible. So um, when you're doing your drawdown at the time of dewatering, um, just incorporating lamprey settings. Um, so either having crews that are specifically tasked with lamprey work or um, going back and forth on your um, pre programmed settings. So your bony fish salmonid settings and then your lamprey settings. Um, that allows you to target both groups of fish efficiently. Um, and oftentimes we do multiple passes. So we're gonna be incorporating those multiple passes with lamprey settings as well. Um, and then as we're drawing down, again, using those lamprey settings in conjunction with our salmonid settings, and then adding that last step of dry shocking. Um, once those sediments have dewatered, um, we can get a lot more lamprey out of our uh, restoration sites using those lamprey settings. And this is also an extremely good time to look for mussels because both lamprey and mussels um, will emerge after dewatering. And so depending on the conditions, they can hold for quite a long time before deciding to emerge. And so this is a great time to uh, salvage both groups of um, animals. And uh, Christine is going to go into this more and a few of these have been mentioned, but we've got a lot of resources online. Um, so it's a great place to start. And as has been said, we are always available to talk about specific projects, um, but there are some great resources online. And in just kind of summary, as far as involve, including lamprey in every step of restoration, um, that starts at that pre-project assessment level. So understanding the habitat that's present at your site and also how um, lamprey utilize different habitats. Um, thinking about the fact that you can have multiple life stages present year round at your project site. Um, and then incorporating those designs that enhance um, habitat for larvae and adults. Um, so that complexity and connectivity is highly important. Um, that lateral and vertical um, connectivity, so restoring those natural processes, increased, increasing wetted area, um, as well as that increased sediment sorting is really beneficial. And then making sure that those migration corridors are open up and downstream. 
And then uh, during implementation, be prepared that lamprey are present and um, utilize those lamprey specific monitoring and salvage techniques um, and try to reduce impacts on lamprey where possible. So that is the very um, high level recommendations for including lamprey in habitat restoration, which um, this group, many people in this group are doing an excellent job of doing. So it's been uh, great to partner with many of you on, on this. Great, thank you, Monica. Um, Paul, you had your hand up. Is that, can we have a, one really quick question before we yeah, move on thanks. to Christina? Thanks, Monica, for your presentation. Um, one of the slides that talked about excessive sedimentation. Is there any additional gu guidance or information regarding what that means? So um, mostly that's just referring to um, the fact that in a lot of our streams that we don't have structure that's not actually creating any pockets of diverse sediment. Um, we can have those excess, you know, We've all seen the streams that have giant uh, fine sediment cut banks and they're they're just overloading our system with fine sediment, which is something that we target and think about a lot when it comes to salmonids, that we don't want this excess fine sediment. And when it comes to lamprey, you know, they utilize that fine sediment. If we've got structure in place and we've got um, natural river processes restored, those fine sediments are going to be collected on those, you know, periphery of our streams, behind structures, and larva lamprey can utilize them. Where it becomes a problem, um, just like for our salmon and steelhead, if we have these pulses of, of a lot of fine sediment at the wrong time, we can get smothering of reds um, and nests for our larval lamprey. And so that's really where we see we can have negative impacts. Um, you know, for those of you who were at Steigerwald, um, that was a lot of fine sediment and there were a ton of larval lamprey in there, right? And so larval lamprey are going to utilize that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, restoring the natural processes is not the, the best thing for that stream because again that's just one life stage and our other uh lar our juveniles are going to and our larger larvae are going to move into those kind of coarser material oftentimes um they need that diversity so simplification and one kind of massive um overwhelming sediment source of fine sediments is not necessarily going to facilitate that kind of whole life stage um support for lamprey um and so when we're thinking about that in the context of salmon and steelhead, we think fine sediment bad all the time. For lamprey, not bad all the time, but definitely restoring those processes and having that sorting, that's kind of the natural job of our rivers, is going to be beneficial. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Monica. Um, so I think we're going to run over a little bit. I don't want to shortchange um, Christina. So if anybody has to pop off at 11, um, don't worry about it. We're going to, we have this, uh, the science work group is being recorded and we will post that along with the presentations on the website. And then for Ben and um, uh, Christina, Joe and Monica, I, there's been some requests to put uh, some of the resources at the Columbia River Estuary Conference. We have usually up, up by the registration desk we'll have some uh, like a table for handouts so maybe we could coordinate on I can I can grab some stuff from you all and put that uh, you know some information on lamprey at the conference so a lot of folks can grab it that way so um so there you go but everybody if you have to leave at 11 it should be good um so uh yeah just look for uh the presentations and the uh just come back to the website and you can you'll see the recording and the presentation. So without further ado, Christina, I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, can you see the slide without the other stuff? OK, uh, well, you can or see the slide, the other slides, okay. not okay, in the presentation. Hold OK, hold on a second. It's sharing the wrong screen here. Yeah. Um, so hang on. How about that? Yes, perfect. Okay. Okay. So just so just so people know, so we we um, designed these talks today. I'm just gonna literally do like a mop up. So I I think I will. It'll be probably five minutes, um, and really sharing because everybody else who spoke today gave a lot of the information, um, you know, about resources, about the Lamprey Initiative, about some other things. So my presentation is really to just reinforce 
everything that was said and tell you how you can get involved and some specific things that might be helpful to you for involvement um, and then also these resources. So let's uh, cruise through this. So we've talked a bit um, in generalities about the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative. It is a wide ranging uh, partnership from Alaska to Southern California. We have 18 regional management units within the Lamprey Initiative. Uh, it was started in 2007 and we have hundreds of partners. Um, we just signed, revised and re-signed our conservation agreement um, last year in 2022. Um, this group gets together on an annual basis for the Lamprey Information Exchange, which some of you probably have participated in, which is like our annual science symposium. Um, we just had Lamprey Summit 5 last year, which is the fifth iteration of Lamprey Summit. The first one was in 2004. So it's, it's a really active partnership that raises awareness and gathers all of these interested parties uh, who are doing Lamprey research and conservation. So how are we, how is the PLCI thinking about restoration um, and how can you get involved? So tons of partnerships, which the other speakers have talked about, the regional management units and projects coming out of the regional management units. We have funding opportunities, which I'd like to specifically tell you about. We have the Lamprey Technical Work Group. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. And then of course we have a whole list of resources on technical guidance and, and other information. So as far as partnerships, um, the other speakers talked about the types of projects that are going on, um, passage modification, translocation programs, um, you know, re uh, modifying and replacing culverts, um, holistic uh, ecosystem type restoration projects, outreach, um, just a whole number of uh, projects that partners are working on together within the PLCI. So two ways that you all can specifically get involved um, are being in a regional management unit group. Those groups talk about the threats that are ongoing in local areas. Um, they contribute information to the assessment that Monica talked about. Um, we have regional implementation plans in each of these regional management units, which identifies threats and needed research and conservation actions in those areas. They collaborate on project proposals, um, they work on implementation of projects, and they do outreach. And then, of course, there's the Lamprey Technical Work Group, um, which puts out a whole lot of technical information on various topics important for Lamprey. The funding sources that we have, we have two. Um, one is through Bonneville Power Administration, and that is for projects in Columbia Basin Regional Management Units only. Um, we have about 300,000 in project funds annually. Those are the types of projects. It's quite wide ranging, the types of projects that can be funded. The RFP for that is typically in September, October timeframe. Then we, the PLCI is one of 20 national fish habitat partnerships. So we also get NIFHAP funding um, and it's about also about 300,000 in project funds. And that can be applied to all regional management units from Alaska to California. The RFP for that is um, typically in December or January. So just showing you, these are some examples of types of restoration projects that have been funded with these funds. So it is wide ranging as far as regional management unit and also the types of projects. So I highly recommend if you have, the key is that it has to benefit Lamprey specifically. It can't be a Salmonid project that has Lamprey written in to it. It has to specifically show benefits to Lamprey. But other than that, it is quite flexible. The Lamprey Technical Work Group has a lot of different subgroups. Um, these have been mentioned, several of them today, um, but just showing you the, the large list of te technical topics that the Lamprey Work Group works on. And anybody, you all are welcome to join any of these um, subgroups within the Lamprey Technical Work Group or the larger work group as a whole. And I can be a, a resource if you wanna get a hold of the leads of these subgroups to join. Otherwise you can find out information on our website. So now here comes the list of available resources. And clearly I'm not going to read all of these, but I just want to tell you that all of these resources that the other speakers spoke about today, we have in one place. And I think it might be difficult. I, I totally agree. We'd love to provide a lot of materials at the conference um, next month, but 
printing out all this stuff is probably not going to be possible. So having lists of available resources, um, I think would be great and places that people could find them. And we also have a version of this that has links. So that could be something that could be sent to you, um, but we could have a paper copy that just has lists. So we have all of these regional plans and general information like the initiative, like the assessment, the regional implementation plans. I wanted to pay, um, give a special notice to our lamprey distribution maps, which Monica was talking about. They up until now have been, well, they currently are in databasein.org, but we're actually changing it to ArcGIS online, which is gonna be a bit easier to access and navigate. So stay tuned for that change. We have the brochure that Ben talked about from ODFW. Here are all of the, you know, the best management guidelines for native lampreys during in-water work, the comparison of Pacific lamprey and Pacific salmon life histories, dredging, habitat restoration guide, practical guide. Here we have a whole bunch of passage guidance um, that Joe talked about, incorporating adult lamprey passage at fishways, design guidelines, road crossings, barriers to tidal connectivity. Um, we you know, eDNA, ID guides, um, all climate vulnerability, um, just basic broad paper that Ben did about conservation challenges and research needs. Um, fish screens, multiple resources about fish screens and how lampreys uh, interact with that. So this information coming out of what Joe was talking about. Um, and then we have to include mussels. Um, Monica was was saying about you know mussels also sharing habitat and um, with lampreys. So there are a lot of resources about mussels as well. And you can see, uh, go to their website, pnwmussels.org. So um, just, this is our website, pacificlamprey.org. You can find a lot of the things we talked about there today. And this is our contact information, one more time, all in one place. So pacificlamprey.org, and then if you have a question, a specific, or sorry, a more general question maybe that doesn't go to one of us, although you can always email us, you can email info at pacificlamprey.org, and that will get to a lamprey expert who can answer your question. And that's it. Perfect, great, thank you. So we do have a couple of minutes for questions. Does anyone have any uh, questions for any of the speakers? That was a lot of information. <laughs> you can see we could have talked for a lot longer. We have lots of <laughs> Yeah, lots it of needed more. to be a workshop, I feel like, but uh, yeah. Haida, do you want to continue your conversation with Ben a little bit? Or Paul, do you have any questions about um the upcoming Ridgefield Pits project. I know you've already started reaching out to Joe and Monica. I'll defer to Paul and others. I think I saw a hand up. Um who did I? Uh, I think it's Juan Jose. Do you have a question? I do. Um Thank you all. Uh, this is so very rewarding um, information on Lamprey. I really appreciate the invitation, Joe, and uh, everyone else. Uh, my quick question is, um, is material and learning um, outreach in, uh, in English and Spanish to reach out the Latino audience in Oregon or in other various parts of, of the Pacific Northwest on Lamprey? That is an excellent question. I feel like that doesn't exist, but it needs to. <laughs> we, yeah, we're we're working on. It. Actually, JJ is being quite modest because he's he's helping a bit with the with the idea of doing Spanish translation um, and working with our outreach coordinator at our office. So I, I agree, it needs to be it needs to be more, and we need to create versions of all of these resources in um, in Spanish. Would be amazing if we could do that. It would be really good to put it into some of the Asian community languages as well. Excellent idea. Yes, I'm absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm writing that down. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Not just the Latino community, but broader you know, audiences, a uh, huge opportunity. Great, thanks. 
Um, I think Curtis is asking, what is the maximum depth you may find lamprey in sediments? Joe responded, uh, do you want to, I think, 23 centimeters? Yeah, I mean, it depends on size, you know, generally 15, but in some laboratory work that USGS did at the Cook Lab here, uh, up to 23 centimeters. But that was using coarse sand, like um, like like play type sand that you buy at Home Depot. Um, but we're out doing work, really. They're they're in this really fine stuff, the kind of stuff that when you step in, you can barely get your foot out of. That's like uh, the mega load for lamprey, and it's another thing we really don't have. I, I come from a background of doing suitability work and habitat modeling on fishes. And we had some really good micro habitat suitability criteria for lampreys. We use this criteria that was developed on the East Coast for sea lampreys, and it's type one, two, three. Um, I think we could improve upon that a lot, um, but we haven't gone there yet. And my, my point is um, particle size matters and lamprey size matters. It's not well um, studied in the wild. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Erica? Hi, I was just curious about um, with the lamprey salvage that you would do ahead of time. Is that something that is specialized work or something that could be oriented around like a big volunteer? You said you needed a lot of people and extra hands and things. Um, I was just curious about the details of that type of work and whether or not that works in a volunteer setting or not. So uh, for a number of folks on this call, they were involved uh, in the Staggerwald um, salvage efforts. And uh, what we kind of recommend is having volunteers can definitely come out and help. Um, you know, there's I think there were a number of volunteers that are associated with the refuge that were helping us with that salvage. Um, and so having kind of a crew lead that is familiar with the lamprey shocking kind of methodologies and can direct the crew is recommended. And then having the support team with the nets and the buckets and um, coming out to support the uh, uh, large salvage efforts are are really crucial. I think um, Joe probably knows these numbers more, but we had, I think, 30 to 40 people on site for four days at Steigerwald. Um, and so it was a, a huge, huge effort. Um, and having volunteers out there that are willing to um, get totally muddy and uh, walk that stream over and over again is pretty uh, pretty essential. Um, and so that, that East Fork, um, Lewis site that's been mentioned a couple times um, that will likely have multiple salvage events. Um, and uh, we were talking about we don't know if there's enough biologists locally to actually uh, accomplish it and come out all the time. So I'm sure having um, some level of volunteers for that one would be really neat, too. Um, but yeah, we had a, a couple of volunteers that were out, I think, like uh, several days in a row helping with that Steigerwald project project. Just to add a, little bit, add a little bit to that, oftentimes your best source of information, depending on, on where you are, is your local biologists, travel representatives. They have the information, you know, it's basically their backyard. And we had that for Staggerwald. But you got to go out there before anything happens and just look. Do you have really low densities, moderate, or really high? And then if you got really high densities, hold your butts. Oh, that's funny. Thanks. Any other questions? These are great. You great got us all here. Topics. You might as well ask. Try to stump us. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So this was a question that came up with Staggerwald. Um, I think is uh, the question about like because it seemed like every time you electroshocked, you got more, right? And we feel like we still probably missed some. Um, so I thought there was some conversation about like literally like just kind of like bucketing or digging them out. Is that just insane? Is trying to like as a way of trying to move them? I mean, yeah, that's a lot of material to sort through and expense. I mean, you know, looking for little brown gold nuggets and all that sediment. Um, we did do a piece of work with USGS using a, um, a portable suction dredge, which went over a sluice box, but you have sedimentation concerns. It's a pretty easy way to do it. And for some environments, like if you had a coastal or estuary environment where you're doing restoration, 
and the salinity was over just one part per thousand, which isn't much, you can't do any electrofishing. So you would might have to use something like this. Um, I, it's it's a problem we haven't really you know, like Ridgefield pits. I'm I don't know what we're going to do. Um, Hopefully we'll look back at this at a presentation three or four years down the road and go, man, we killed it. Or like, oh man, we just totally stumbled on that one. Who knows? <laughs> hey, Joe, I'd like to add to that one. Um, here recently uh, we did some uh, surveys in the estuary in uh, the Sayus Law and, uh, you know, high salinity. So we had that problem. Just took a uh, shovel in a bucket and went and sampled several sites and, uh, Everyone was high clay content, really stinky, so anoxic, and we saw almost no aquatic insects. And so we were quite comfortable in going, there's probably very little to no lamprey here. So there's there's another tool folks can do without any special tools. Great, thank you. Anybody else? I guess I do have one question, and maybe maybe it's for Catherine. Um, do, do you know if the Columbia Estuary Ecosystem Restoration Program has guidelines for lamprey conservation that are formalized in our restoration? Um, not that I'm aware of. I think they probably, I think most of the restoration practitioners, so you all work with um, them, like Tom Josephson with Crest and um, Washington DFW, like Alex Uber and Laura Brown, um, and then Columbia Land Trust. Um, so Ian Sinks and those guys. I think when they do restoration as part of permitting, they probably call up Joe or Monica um, or up in Oregon. They probably call them up and ask like about salvage kind of work. And I know when we evaluate projects with the project review committee, we 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 sort of pepper them with those kind of questions. But it's not a um, it's just basically I think it's an evolving sort of thing. So we had this conversation back in 2020 to try to get folks to start thinking about it a little bit more explicitly. But it is it is. Um, I think an evolving field, I think, if you will. Thanks. I don't know if you want to add to that, Monica, or Joe. I was just going to add that it's an evolving field at every level. So um, working for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, you know, there are a number of biologists that have been focused on lamprey and including lamprey in conservation for years, but it's not necessarily universal. And so um, educating you know, biologists for the state is um, a really important thing to do because there's, I focused on salmon for many years and never thought about lamprey, you know, we are so salmon focused. And so um, I think that that education happens for our restoration practitioners, but also our, our salmon and biologists that are, you know, that are focused on, um, you know, a different parts of the state, different activities, um, our habitat biologists who are actually writing those provisions like that. Education is um, for Washington uh, starting to expand, but it's needed at every level, um, which is kind of one of the great things that I think PLCI has done is just getting this information accessible to people and really trying to um, educate that uh, if you noticed on those threats, um, lack of awareness is one of the top threats, and that is almost universal <laughs> across many of our watersheds. It's at least a moderate to high threat. Um, and so that lack of information is is just pervasive. And so that's like what we're hoping to accomplish with these sorts of uh, presentations and then also within our agencies. Yeah, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, North American Journal of Fisheries Management has a special issue coming out that's only on lampreys, so it's like the coolest thing ever, right? Um, and within that, there will be one that synthesizes all the science on dewatering and highlighting some of the deficiencies. For example, at Staggerwald, did we salvage 5% of them, 50% of them, 85% of them? You know, we don't, we don't know. Uh, we know that we never got anything that looked like depletion sampling when you can model a curve looking at how many are being removed and, and estimate it really couldn't do that. We wanted to do some work ahead of time, doing some density work in certain sections and then go salvage those accordingly and say, oh, how many do we get? Just didn't have the resources to pull that off. But, um, you know, with the fecundity of females, you know, upwards of 200,000 eggs, 
Uh, we don't know what egg to fry survivors or survival later on throughout the larval life stage, and it will vary widely depending on your area. Maybe it doesn't make that much difference. Maybe it makes a significant difference depending on the local population. Sure is fun. Thank you. Well, thanks, Joe. Glad you have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I know everybody else at Staggerwald had a, had a blast doing that too. So, um, anything else? So I am gonna um, say, like Christina or Ben, if you all have like a poster or something that you wanna, um, I could put up a poster. We do have a poster evening social social um, going on the very first night, so we could put something up. That kind of talks about this and then maybe puts a plug towards the lamprey pacific lamprey.org sort of website and all the resources and if you have i'm sure you do have like handouts of the like this maybe i even just makes uh handouts of those slides of yours christina where it just lists all the different resources that would be good okay yeah yeah, yeah. we can yeah we can put something together <clears throat> okay. go ahead ben. I think Christina is also being modest. Fish and Wildlife Service has a lot of stuff. I don't know if they're out of stock. Monica's got stuff for WDFW, and I, I'll get the brochures to you via Jim Brick. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Anything else, anybody? Well, just really, really appreciate it, you guys. That was a really awesome set of presentations. Thanks so much for coordinating everything ahead of time. And yeah, really. Really great. A lot of information, I think. Um, so yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much for all the hard work. Thank you for having us. Yeah, You're thanks welcome. for coordinating everything, Catherine. Yeah. Many You're thanks. I, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. See y'all. Thank you. <laughs>